Hello again guys and welcome back to Let's Learn Civilization. As usual to start off let us end the last turn and see what is going to happen. Bismarck has entered the industrial era. So at the moment what we're heading for we're still trying to go for a scientific victory which means that I need to concentrate on production that I can convert to science and also building any buildings that give me science and when we can make some oh, or accept some new social policies we're going to start going into the rationalism tree because this will really increase the amount of science we can get we're on turn 277 which is just beyond the halfway point of the game not entirely sure how possible it is going to be to have a diplomatic victory as our backup. That was the original plan. But unfortunately, America seems to be getting quite a big grasp on the city-states because they've been settling everywhere. And I'm not doing particularly well on money at the moment. So my backup plan for a diplomatic victory may not be possible. But, you know, we'll see where it goes. Maybe I'll have a bit more money towards the end of the game. Cork will now produce a shrine because it will give it a little bit of extra food. And let's get all the caravans doing what they need to be doing. Let Right, where were you going previously? Corinth for six gold per turn. Well, we could go to Argos for seven. So let us do that. I did think about sending one to Cork to take some additional food, but I don't think we will. So... A couple of questions have been put my way over the last few days, and they do kind of relate together quite nicely. Um, I don't intend to get into a research agreement here because I can't afford it. Uh, one of the first questions I've been asked was regarding to the individual civilizations, as in which civilizations do I like to play, and is there any civ that is particularly better than another? I think. The thing with civilizations, particularly in Civ 5, is they're all very, very similar. What you've got to remember is each civilization has a unique civilization bonus that normally affects the civilization for the entirety of the game, but some of them are very situational. So, for example, if we take the Japanese ability, which allows an injured unit to fight at full strength, that's only really useful to you if you plan to go down the route of a domination victory. I mean, of course it's good against barbarians and, and fending off a war, but it's not particularly all that useful in other situations. If you look at people like the English, who have plus two movement in uh, water, and you look at somebody like the Polynesians, who start with the Embark promotion without having to research optics, and the uh, Denmark, who don't receive the penalty for disembarking, they're all great um, sort of unique bonuses, particularly if you're on a map with a lot of water, if you're on a continents map or an archipelago map. Um, let's try that again, an archipelago map. And that's fine, but if you're playing on a Pangea-style map and you're right in the middle and you're completely landlocked, then that civilization's bonuses becomes completely useless. Like, we take the, the Celts, for example. The civilization bonus is Druidic Law. So I get um, one faith per turn from having an unimproved forest tile next to a city. That goes up to two faiths per turn for having three or more forest, unimproved forest tiles next to a city. Well, how many of my cities are going to have that many unimproved forest tiles next to them, particularly late game? As you can see now, I mean, these, these tiles here are unimproved. I don't think roads actually count as, as an improvement for the tile, um, but I could be wrong. I need to check that out. But a lot of my cities don't actually have forest tiles near them. Obviously, start bias is on, so we do start near forest cities. But the point is, that particular bonus, that particular advantage, only really helps me towards the beginning of the game. And it's good, because it's a very good way to get some early science going on. All right. Um, Zulu is currently going to surprise attack another civilization, though we don't know who. 
Still got the Greeks spying on us. We'll let it slide this time. And uh, we might have to go and um, take the fight to him if this carries on. So, right, I'll get back to what I was saying just as soon as I have done this. Let's go for a temple. So, as far as the, the Celts go, it's a good bonus early on because it means you're most likely going to be the first civilization to found a pantheon and found a religion, which means you get pick of the beliefs, which is a good thing. Um, yeah, he's just getting grumpy. So what I would say, as far as the civilizations go for their unique abilities, some of them are more useful than others, but they are very situational. And, oh, we found a... We have actually found an ancient ruin there. Also, a civilization will have either one unique unit and a unique building. 20 cultures, is that all I got? Uh, they will either have one unique uh, unit and a unique building, or they will have two unique units. Now, again, if you have a unique building, the unique buildings aren't too bad because a unique building is usually useful from start to finish more or less it does depend on what the building is and what the building does and sometimes it does actually take a while for you to be able to unlock that building depending on the tech level of it but the, the buildings are normally an upgrade to an existing building and will run the course of the game but units again are very situational first of all most unit upgrades that you get are military so if you're not playing an aggressive game then they can become a little useless. I mean, early game, they're not too bad because you can use them to defeat barbarians. And even, you know, mid to late game, there's still barbarians on the map. So there are always going to be times when you possibly need to fight. Let's get these guys to safety. In fact, I'm not sure if I can. So we're going to give them survivalism and then move them out of the way, hopefully. But yeah, as far as it goes for having unique units, you've got the problem that they quickly get upgraded. If we take the fact that we had the Pictish Warriors, which was the unique unit for the uh, the Celts. Where are we? The Celts. The Pictish Warrior. So it replaces the standard Spearman, which is one of the first units that you get in the game. You get your warriors, you get your archers, you get your spearmen. So it replaces the standard spearmen, and it's upgraded by pikemen, which is when we get civil service, which isn't that far into the tech tree. So we've got a unique unit that is very useful, but it very, very soon gets overtaken and becomes obsolete. It's good for killing barbarians because even though you do have an XP cap which stops your units leveling up on killing barbarians, once a unit hits 30 XP, no longer gets any XP from killing barbarians. But the um, earns 50% of the opponent's strength as faith for kills still applies even once you've hit that cap. So it does have its use early game, but then it gets overtaken and it isn't worth anything else. Um, then we get the Selid Hall, which replaces the Opera House. And that's fair enough, but we don't get... Where do we get Opera Houses? It is under... Nope, I've gone past it. Where is it? Drama, uh, drama and Poetry? It's here somewhere. Lost Opera Houses now. This is bad, isn't it? I can't even remember where it is. Somewhere around here. must be going blind acoustics it's under acoustics yeah sell it all so we actually have to get to the renaissance era before our unique building even kicks in and it's slightly better stats than you get from an opera house and of course that will carry on through the entire rest of the game but unique units aren't so useful if we take somebody like um germany as well Germany has two unique units. They have the, uh, I think that's Landsknecht, it's pronounced. Could be wrong. I'm sure all of my German viewers are cringing currently, but I do not speak any German. Uh, and it basically, it replaces the pikemen. So it is a f sort of mid to late, um, well, sort of, no, early to mid level uh, unit. But then it easily gets replaced by the Lancer, which doesn't take 
too long to come along. And then the next unit they have is the Panzer, which just replaces the uh, the standard tank. So it's an upgraded version of the tank. But you're not going to get that until right near the end of the game as well. So what I would say is, I mean, what I tend to do is I random the civilization that I play. And I'm going to build a hospital here just to give Dublin some extra food because it's growing quite slowly. Do we want we want to embargo the Zulus? Probably won't pass, but we will see. So I usually just random the civilization because it forces you to play a civilization that you may not have otherwise selected. But there isn't an awful lot of difference between them. The different bonuses and uniques you get from different civs do offer a little bit of flavor and a little bit of variety. Apparently we've declared war on Shaka. Ah, it's because Shaka has declared war on Washington. Okay. So, the Zulus are at war with us now, but we've got a defensive pact, which instantly means he should also be at war with Germany as well. We'll have a look at that in a moment. And try and get these guys healed up. Okay, Germany and Egypt made a public declaration of friendship. Your city-state allies declared war on Shaka... Uh, Shaq has declared war on Washington. Ah, but there we go. It was because he hasn't declared war on me. If he'd have declared a war on me directly, then he'd be going to war with um, Egypt and Germany as well as America. I'm not really going to get too involved with this because America is quite a distance away from me. So I'm not going to sort of get too involved because it's, it's just too far away for it to be practical. Uh, plus of which, on top of that, I may well end up um, thinning America's diplomatic reach out a bit, which wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. So we're going to move this guy, because he's fled Greece. Uh, sorry, he's fled uh, the Zulus, and we are going to put him in Athens and keep a bit of an eye on the Greeks. So yeah, going back to what I said, I just tend to random the civilization I play, because the differences between them add a bit of extra flavour. But don't make that much of a difference, really. Um, right, they're happy. What's going on now? Open borders with Egypt, we can do that. Of course, there are some times where if you're trying to get a specific type of victory, or if you're going to, if you're after achievements and you're doing something very specific, then you might want to play a specific um, civilization. I mean, a good example of that. They're going to survive. A good example of that would be if you wanted to uh, win a, a 1v1 on a dual map, a good nation to pick would be Japan because the quickest and easiest way to do it is with a domination victory and having those units that can fight at full strength even when they're taking damage is a really, really good way uh, to win an aggressive fighting style game. If you are playing on a map and you know that it's going to have a lot of water on the map, uh, then you might want to play as the English or Denmark or the Polynesians. But if you play the game the way it's meant to be played, where everything's on fairly random, you don't know who your opponents are going to be, you don't know what type of map you're going to be on, then having a civilization with a specific ability isn't necessarily going to help. I think you should play to the strengths of a particular civilization you shouldn't ignore their bonuses when you find out who you've got if they've got a bonus try and make the most of it but you shouldn't let it define your playstyle too much what i would say is that certain certain civilizations unique abilities do lend themselves better to certain types of victories however every civilization is capable of winning every type of victory so don't let it sort of pigeonhole you into what you do. So, oh, Zulus have denounced Egypt. So, the second thing that a lot of people have been asking me, and I'm just going to quickly look there because, ah, Egypt have actually uh, settled a city up there. That's interesting. It's on the old, um, the old Brazilian city that was there. It wasn't their capital. That wasn't Brazil's capital. I've also just noticed they've settled a city up here as well, which I'm not particularly pleased about. They could be trying to get that oil. 
Now, one of the reasons I set up here is because I actually wanted to get some of these resources. So what I'm going to try and do, if I can, is buy these resource tiles. Now, of course, this is going to annoy Egypt. But Egypt did just decide they were going to pop up right next to me, which I, I'm very uncomfortable about. Um, but I'm totally broke now, but that stops them growing any. So, you know, they're not going to be happy about that, but we will see what happens. Let's build the recommended market at Douglas. Get some money coming in. So, oh, hang on. Let's have a mint. Wow, a lot of things ended their production on that turn, didn't they? Let's go for a university as well. Start getting some more science coming in. So, one of the other questions that has been asked of me recently is what is the most important... But we already had that. What is the most important resource? Is it science? Is it gold? Is it culture? Well, you've got to remember that most of these sort of um, grand strategy games have the same kind of resources in a way. They always have some form of currency. They always have some form of science. They always have some form of production. And they will usually have some form of food as well. So, we'll forget happiness for now. I mean, happiness is something that you always want to keep as high as much as you can. But I don't really count it as much of a, a, a resource, nor the golden age. What I tend to look at for a resource, e even the religion um, to a certain extent isn't really that important. If you're looking at the main four, it's science, gold, production, and food. Now, what I would say is to a vast degree, they're all equally important because they can all be subbed out for one another. If you have a lot of gold, you can use that gold to instantly buy buildings, and those buildings can increase your food production, your science production, and your culture output. If you have a lot of culture, you can use that to buy social policies. Those social policies can be used to increase your science, your gold income, and your food and growth if you have a lot of food you can use that to grow your civilization more quickly that bigger civilization can then work more tiles which allows you to produce more science more gold and more culture and of course having more science allows you to research better technologies which unlocks uh, higher buildings and those better buildings you can build which will give you more gold science food and culture so it's important to try and level everything up together because they all do synergize well with one another but what i would say one of the most important is is science because whatever type of victory you're heading for having a, a good grip a good grip on the science tree is one of the best things you can do. If you're going for a diplomatic victory, being quite high up the science tree is very useful because it will mean that you will have the ability to build stronger units than your opponents. If you're going for a cultural victory, being higher up... Yeah, there we go. He's a little bit upset by that. Oops, sorry. If you are going for a cultural victory... Being higher up the science tree is useful because you can build uh, more buildings that give you great work slots and help you produce great artists and great writers, as we've just had one pop up there, which will give you more culture. If you're going for a scientific victory, obviously you just want to rush science anyway. If you're going for a diplomatic victory, you're going to need a fair bit of gold so you can bribe the various other city-states. You're also going to need as many spies as you can get, and you get extra spies each time you enter a new era. So again, by going up through the science tree, you unlock those buildings that help you produce more gold. You also unlock the different eras which give you additional spies. On top of that, of course, Unlocking the science tree allows you to get buildings that help with your culture. That culture can then be used in things like commerce that will give you more gold and can be used in things like patronage, which will allow you to get better influence as city-states. So all of these resources are connected and you should really sort of try to level them all up together. But I think having an advantage in the science tree is really, really useful. 
Not only that, by having an advantage in the science tree, it also means you don't have to worry about putting your spies in other cities to try and steal from them. There's no point because you're scientifically ahead of everybody else. It also means that everybody else... Is the following trade of interest. Yeah, we'll carry on with that. It also means that everybody else is very, very likely to try and steal technology from you. So if you keep a high level spy in your capital city, which is where they're most likely to target you, keep a spy in your capital city and they'll just keep throwing spies at you and getting them killed, which is an advantage for you because they have to wait for their spies to be re-recruited. So when a spy gets killed, they do get them back after a while, they recruit a new spy, uh, but it does take time. And every time they get a spy killed, they, you know, lose some turns. So we're going to go for rationalism now. We've got uh, enough money for another social policy. We could finish off Liberty here, uh, which means each time we found a city, the um, co uh, increased culture cost of policies goes up by 33% less than normal, and it will start a golden age. It would also give us a great person of our choice near the capital, but I'd sooner go for rationalism because this is basically a science tree. So adopting rationalism will instantly give us 10% more science in the empire, providing the empire is happy. It'll also unlock the porcelain tower. And if we adopt all the policies in this tree, we will be able to purchase great scientists with faith. Now remember, we can generate a lot of faith from druidic lore to some extent, although it's a little bit dated now. But using our spare faith to purchase additional um, great scientists is absolutely brilliant. And we also get some really, really good things in here. Great scientists earn 25% faster. Um, plus one science for every trading post and an extra 17% science from universities. Well, we've got the universities in nearly every city. Um, two science from every specialist, and that's not just science specialists, that's every specialist in every city. And one gold from science buildings and then boost science gained from research agreements by 50%. Not necessarily that important because I don't tend to enter into a lot of research agreements. But adopting all the policies gives us that ability to buy great scientists with faith. So we're going to go for rationalism. And that will give us a bit more scientific output. We are going to go for a hospital in Cardiff. We still need to concentrate on growing some of these outer cities because the growth rate has stalled a little bit and we do need to get our science up a considerable bit more. I still think we are the furthest ahead on science as it goes, so I'm not worried too much about that. Obviously, Egypt were upset that I bought these tiles, and rightly so. I mean, it's a little bit out of their way, popping a random city up here. I was very surprised by that. Okay, Shaka wants to make peace with us, which is very, very interesting. He also wants to give us gold per turn for doing it. Well, I'm going to accept. Uh, we are in a defensive pact with America. And America... Uh, oh, Shaka's made peace with Washington. So he's made peace with us all. That's fine. Maybe he's learned his lesson. So as I was saying, I bought these tiles here for two reasons. Firstly, I set up this city here because I wanted to capture these resources and because his city was closer The chances were he was going to end up getting that stone and potentially that oil He may well still get that oil because this is four hexes away and I won't uh, I can't buy that tile I may naturally expand to that tile, but he will probably get there first so it's very unlikely that we are go because in, in 11 turns because this is another important thing with culture. The amount of culture you've got coming in affects how quickly your borders grow. So in 11 turns, I will get that hex. I may or may not ever get that hex. So it's a, it's a bit, of di bit of a difficult one. We've got a fair bit of oil, so I don't mind that too much. But we will need oil later on, particularly if we want to head towards things like aircraft and some of the better boats. So... What we could do is build a porcelain tower. We'll get a great scientist and 50% more science generated from research agreements. Now, because that wonder doesn't affect anything in the particular city it's in, it doesn't really matter which city we build it in. There are some of the wonders that affect 
the, the city it's built in. So it might be an additional 50% science in the city in which it's built. If that was the case, you'd want to build it in whichever city was outputting the most science to get the most benefit from it. This just gives us an extra 50% science from research agreements, so it doesn't really matter what city it's built in. So we'll build it in Dublin. Now, obviously, we may be the first people to be able to get it because it does require rationalism. So... I think what we're going to go for now is... Now, let me get this in the right order. I'm going to go for electricity because it will allow us to find the aluminium on the map and it will also allow us to build a police station, which we could really do with building to try and stop the spies from stealing tech from us at our capital. Which does mean that I'm going to have to build constabularies at various cities which will get done but in the meantime we still want to increase the amount of food that is output in some of these cities just to get them going so i think what i'm going to actually do first though is pop up this observatory in douglas because an observatory is something you can do if you are built next to a mountain um, which is really weird because we're not next to a mountain, but I think the uh, Boehringer Crater counts as a mountain because it's impassable. Um, but we're going to build the observatory anyway. And that will give us an extra 50% science from that city. So we're just going to do everything we can do to try and boost science at the moment. So we've got lots of lumber mills here. These lumber mills have been built to increase uh, production. But what we could do, and probably will do for a bit, because sometimes you do have to swap and change between the uh, the various focuses on cities. Why does it keep snapping me to those guys? Very annoying. We're going to go back to Edinburgh. And we're going to go back to city management. And we're actually still on science focus. I'd have thought it was on production focus, given the amount of uh, lumber mills we have around. It would be nice for it to grow, so I'm going to go back to default focus for a while because I do want it to try and grow a little bit faster. I'm still going to manually assign some specialists to uh, the science uh, specialist slots because I do want science to improve. But we'll keep our eye on that. Hopefully this should help uh, Edinburgh grow a little bit as well. We also need to improve happiness a little bit because it's now gone down to two. Um, and a lot of it is actually generated by population. Right, he wants quite a lot from us for a research agreement, and I've got no interest in doing that. So we want to grow a little bit more, but we want to grow carefully, and we also want to increase our happiness. That is the goal for the next few turns at least, because happiness seems to be dropping almost with every individual... Um, almost every individual turn now we have factories in three cities now what this means is we can adopt an ideology normally you can only adopt an ideology if you get a factory in three cities or you hit a certain era or half the players hit a certain era i can't remember what it is actually but what you do there are three types of ideology and they can be adopted by multiple civilizations and different types of ideology, and you can click here for the details what you get from them, different types of ideology suit different types of victory. So the autocracy um, ideology is suited for a culture, diplomatic and domination victory. Freedom is suited for a culture, diplomatic and science victory. And order is suited for a culture, domination and science victory. Now... If you're an early adopter, if you're the first person to adopt a particular ideology, you get two free tenants. Now, I'm going for a science victory, so autocracy isn't the best one for me. It's either going to be freedom or order. And you can look at the sort of things that you get in them. Uh, some of the stuff is quite nice. Now, there are certain levels. You get level 1, level 2, and level 3 stuff in the tree. And it works very much like like a tree you have to spend well i'll show you actually we're going to go for order though because order gives us some really nice stuff um young pioneers one local happiness from every workshop factory solar nuclear hydro plant one local happiness from every national wonder 
Um, gold purchasing on buildings reduced by 33%. Local happiness from monuments. There's a lot of stuff there. But when you get to level two, food production, science, gold and culture per city plus one. Factories increase the city science output by 25%. Build factories in half the time as usual. And if we get up to tier three, you may finish spaceship parts with great engineers plus 10 science in a capital city. So we're going to go for order, and nobody has it yet. So with the early adopter, we get two free tenants. So we go here, and if we go into ideology, you can see here that public opinion is, though there's no unhappiness, people are content. It is possible sometimes to choose an ideology that differs a lot from the rest of the world, and that's potentially dangerous because you can create a lot of unhappiness in your civilization if you have a different ideology to the rest of the world. And what that can essentially end up with is them forcing you to have to change your ideology. You can do that, but what would happen is you'd lose your free tenants, and also for, th I think it's two or three turns normally on prints, it does depend on the difficulty level, your civilization grinds to a halt. You don't produce any science, you don't produce any gold, you don't produce any food, production, culture, religion, everything stops. So you can still make turns, you can still move units around, you can still attack and queue up buildings, but nothing happens. So it's a very, very bad thing to have to change your um, ideology. Saying that though, it's also even worse if your unhappiness falls so low that your own people start turning against you. It's also possible to actually lose cities as well, that they flip to somebody else's side because they are so unhappy with you. So as you can see, we have seven boxes along the top for level one tenants, four level two tenants, and three level three tenants. We get two free tenants. So I'm going to click a level one tenant because you can't have a level two until you've got two level ones. And you can't have a level three until you've got two level twos, which means you'd have to have three level ones. So let's take our free ones. I would like um, young pioneers, local happiness from every workshop, factory, solar, nuclear, hydro plant. Current happiness is one. So young pioneers, yes. Happiness now goes up to 10. So that's a big boost in happiness. Now, what I think we should go for here is local happiness from every national wonder because we do have a few of those so now happiness goes up from 10 to 15 we've pretty much instantly solved our happiness problem now those were the free ones in order to buy more we need additional culture and remember that is culture that we could also be spending in our social policies so when you get the culture you now have a choice to make do you spend it in your ideology or do you spend it in your normal social policies you do have the choice I think for the time being, except with the maybe one level two, um, there may be one level two tenant that is useful for me, but most of the stuff that is going to benefit me will be in the rationalism, uh, uh, the rationalism tree. So that's what I'm going to keep heading towards. So Cork has finished its production of the library. I'm going to go for an aqueduct and try and build up its size a little bit still really need to keep our eye on the unhappiness right we don't have anything we can build here at edinburgh that will really increase the happiness so we might as well just put its production into research we'll go on to the next turn then i'll make all the plays there then that'll be the last turn before i wrap up this video So the war with the Zulus wasn't nearly as interesting and exciting as I thought it may have ended up being. Not too sure what um, America's military power is actually. It might be worth having a look in the demographics. So if we look at soldiers, yeah, the best is uh, America. I'm actually the lowest. The only thing here that I'm the lowest on is soldiers. I have the highest population, but I have the smallest number of soldiers. Um, literacy is basically science. So the, the Zulus are at the bottom of the science ladder. So I'm top for science, I'm top for happiness, I'm top for production, and I'm top for population. Uh, Zulus seem to have a lot of land. They've got a lot of income. 
and they, they've got a lot of crops. But this is probably the reason why the, uh, the Zulus ended the war quite quickly, because they were feeling a little bit pressured by the Americans. Just back at the score. So we're still top, just by a, an entire four points. Now, the Zulus do have a high score, but that is because they've literally got so much land. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that we can't see over there. I think it might be time to try and get some scouts in and around that area, to be honest, just to have a look what is going on. Uh, what's? Can we still have scouts, or can we get something close? Yeah, we don't have any scouts we could have at the moment. I mean, we could try and send something in there. We could actually buy a great engineer still. We've got enough um, faith to buy a great engineer, which means should a wonder pop up that we particularly want to rush, we could use our great engineer to do that. But I think what I'm going to try and do in the next video is I will produce a unit and just send them out in that, that direction. Try and have a little scout around. There is another way to uncover the map. We're quite a way off that yet. And that's when we get up as far as satellites. Um, where is it? There. Reveals the entire map. So when we get to the information area and we get satellites, we instantly uncover the entire map. But that is quite a way off yet. It's a very, very long way off. So we won't be doing that just yet. So that's pretty much all I can do on this turn, really. Science isn't quite as high as I would like it to be. Uh, as you can see, each city or puppeted city you own increases technology costs by 3%. So there's another reason why it's not ideal to have lots and lots of extra cities. I'm not going to build any more cities at this point. I've got a good portion of the map. I've got a lot of land. I've got a good number of the resources on the map. There are a few other bits and pieces that would be quite nice to get. Like um, Nantes, for example, I think I'm going to uh, just buy that tile and get the oil because it, it's it's worth having. Don't forget, we can always trade that as well. Um, that sugar would be nice, but I don't think we are going to be able to get that. Although we are going to expand there in six turns when our borders grow, we will actually get that tile with the sugar in. So that's quite nice. We just look through some of the other um, cities. Cardiff's going to expand and get us that water tile in eight turns, which isn't particularly useful to us. 13 turns, we're going to get uh, that water tile from Truro. Again, not particularly useful. Uh, Nantes is going to expand and get us those two antiquity sites. It may well be worth sending an archaeologist to them and turning them into a cultural site just so we get the additional culture. Douglas is going to expand a little bit down to the south. That doesn't give us an awful lot, really. Glasgow's going to expand and get some additional oil. That'll be nice. Um, Cork's going to expand that way, which we already know about. And then we're back to Edinburgh. So Edinburgh's going to get us three more tiles there, three more bits of forest, which we could turn into production or food, which is quite nice. The only problem that you have, usually, is that a city will only work tiles within three hexes of the city. So when you have these tiles that are further afield, they're often kind of pointless because they're not really being worked and you only have a limited amount of population. But for the meantime, it's good to expand your borders because it does stop other people from using them. But the, I've got to the point where having more cities will give me more negative effects than positive. So it becomes rather pointless. Uh, just having a look and seeing if there's anything... Because this is the thing, when you set... You, you always need to remember if you set your cities onto research... Uh, focus or wealth uh, production because you may then be able to build additional buildings and it will never remind you that you can change these so I haven't built anything new at Truro for a while I could build a factory there which would increase happiness and increase production so I'm going to do that have we got anywhere else that's on science focus we have oh, Edinburgh we already know that's already done so that's fine so at least we're going to get an extra one happiness from building that so there we go that's all I'm going to do for that turn so thank you very much for watching I hope you're still enjoying the series I uh, apologize if this video has run on a little bit longer and hasn't had quite as much action as we would like but you know I, I play quite passively I don't like going to war uh, I think it um, it's one way of winning the game but a lot of people are just focused on 
uh, winning by domination. I am sure before this game ends, we will end up attacking somebody or getting attacked, but it's not my focus right now. So thanks again for watching. And remember, if you do have any questions, either send me a message or leave it in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer it for you. Until then, I will see you next time. Goodbye for now.